worship together. Oh, 
this to you. All right, well, welcome to church, everybody. We're glad that everybody is here with us tonight. Um, just one quick announcement in prayer, and we'll get right back into worship. Uh, as you see, Pastor Bobby is not here. Uh, Pastor Bobby is with a group from our association that is up in Kentucky right now. Uh, bless you, Ricky Wheeler. Don't you hate to be called out like that? Um, they are in Kentucky right now with the flooding victims. Um, there's been a lot of rain, flooding, mudslides, things like that uh, up in Kentucky. So we have a group from our association that is there. Uh, so please uh, make sure we say a special prayer for them for safety, a uh, prayer that uh, people that are there that don't know Jesus can see Jesus and can be ministered to uh, by their witness and by their work. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Also, on the prayer line today, you saw, uh, if you get that text, Miss Maxine Garrett's great-grandson, Kylan Garrett, is in the hospital. Um, he's having digestion issues. The last thing I, I heard just a little while ago was that he also was having urination issues. And if that got much worse pretty soon, then it was going to have to go up to Augusta. Um, so please, let's take a special time before we get into worship. And we'll pray for our mission trip. And we'll pray for Kylan. And um, we'll get right back into worship. And we'll get into God's word. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we love you tonight. Um, God, we know that we don't deserve to come to you in prayer. God, we know that we don't deserve to bow before you. But you call us righteous, God. You call us worthy under your blood, so we're thankful for that. God, we are thankful that we have the opportunity to come before you tonight in worship, to come before you for your word. Um, God, and if you will just hear our prayer, God, two special things that are on our heart tonight. First, God, the flooding victims and the families that are in Kentucky God, there are uh, rivers and, and roads and bridges that are being washed out. They're limiting the amount of help that's able to get in. But God, you already knew that would happen. God, there are dozens that are missing and unaccounted for. But God, you already knew that that would happen. You know their names. God, you know where they are right now. You know if you've already called them home. God, it's my prayer that through the work of uh, our local association here, God, through the work of others that are ministering up to your image bearers up in Kentucky, God, that somebody would come to know the gospel, that somebody would come to know that they are seen, that somebody would come to know that they are loved and forgiven just by the efforts to serve and to love the way that you've called us to. And God, we also uh, take a special moment to pray for Kylan. God, this might have taken family and friends by surprise. This might have taken our church by surprise, but it doesn't take you by surprise. God, there's nothing that you don't see and there's nothing that you can't heal. So God, as unworthy and as unrighteous as we are, God, we call upon your name and we call upon your hand for Kylan, for his family. God, that a great work would be done, that a great work would be done in the time that you see fit and that you would get the glory for every moment. God, we're just humbled and honored to be in your presence and to be in your house with your people tonight. God, I thank you for your church that is here, God, and that we would leave this place knowing we've been in the presence of a king. We love you and we pray in your powerful name. Amen. Let's stand as we lift these concerns to the Lord through faith.
and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations see worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall reign All right, thank you very much to David and to the band. It's scary when the guy teaching looks like he doesn't even know where he's going to in the Bible. All right, so here's what uh, here's what I want to do tonight. I would say this may not take as long as I normally would, but people normally cringe and buckle their seatbelts when I say that, so um, I won't say that. We're going to be in Psalm 103. And what I want to do tonight is look over Psalm 103, um, and let's just look at it practically, right? You want to always be able to look at Scripture practically, and you want to always be able to look at how Scripture can just apply to our lives. But I want to do that tonight using a couple pieces of scripture references that I'll mention. You can either write them down or not um, as we go through. We won't flip to them, but I'll just mention them. So I want us to read the 103rd Psalm. And then we'll go through section by section and we'll look at it. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So, Father, it is our prayer tonight that you're blessed with us just reading the 103rd Psalm. God, maybe this is a piece of scripture that some of us are familiar with, that some of us aren't, but God, may we just lift our souls to to just bless you by knowing you, by learning a little bit about your character, and by seeing how we can walk out your character in our lives. That's our prayer tonight, God. Amen. So, there's not much we know about the, the 103rd Psalm, where in David's life, on his timeline, it would have been written. Some psalms are very clear. For example, the psalm that David wrote after Nathan confronted him about Bathsheba uh, basically says a psalm of David after Nathan confronted him about Bathsheba. So that's pretty clear. And there are others that give more information, but this is one that just says a psalm of David. Charles Spurgeon speculated, we should attribute it to his later years when he had a higher sense of the preciousness of pardon because of a keener sense of sin than in his younger days. His clear sense of the frailty of life indicates his weaker years and also does the very fullness of his praiseful gratitude. Charles Spurgeon, much smarter than I'll ever be, says, well, if we look at David's language here and we look at the heart that just pours out in what David is saying, he must be older because this sounds like someone who has had years with the Father. Years with the shepherd, years of grace, years of pardons, years of knowing what gratitude really is. So David must be older. Since I see no reason to dispute that, we'll keep going. So let's go back through verses 1 through 5. Let's look at this and see what it says about God and then what that means about our lives today. 1 through 5, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We really just need these first five verses of the 103rd Psalm to have gratitude for God. Yet, in His grace, He's given us 66 books to just help increase our gratitude for Him. But let's just look at what He says. David says, O my soul, all that is within me, bless His holy name. It says that God has all these benefits for us, that he, he forgives us, that He heals us, that He redeems us, that He crowns us, that we're satisfied and that we're renewed. So my question for you tonight, my first question for you tonight, is if this was true for David, mustn't it, and I don't say mustn't a lot, so you're welcome. I just thought of it right in the moment. Mustn't it, I'm not going to try it again. Must that not also mean that that's true about God for us today? If God, if David saw that God is the God that crowns us with mercy, that God is the God that forgives us, that God is the God that that pardons us, that God is the God that that renews us, well then that's got to be true for us today. 
Because if we believe that the Trinity is three in one, and if Hebrews says that Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that must mean that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that must mean the same Father, the same God that David is talking about, is in our presence now. Sometimes it may be more difficult to sense it than others. Sometimes you may not feel a move of the Holy Spirit like other people may not feel, or that they may feel. But can I remind us not to take advantage of something? Every moment that his people are together in his name, he is present. When we came together a few minutes ago and we prayed for flooding victims in Kentucky, he's present. When we came together a few minutes ago and we prayed for the healing of Kylan, he's present. God hears the prayers of his people. The Bible tells us in more than one place that his ear is inclined to the righteous. That God hears us. So my first question is, if that was true of David's life, in David's lifetime, is it not also true of us? We know the answer is yes. Second question, are you really blessing the Lord with your whole soul? Do you really even understand what that means? I'm worried that in the church today that there's a lot of buzzwords that just go around and people don't really understand it. I'm concerned that in the church today there is a lack of depth for the love that people have for their God and for the desire that people have to bless their God. God doesn't need our blessings. God is the giver of blessings. But how amazing, how awesome is it that we, as no good people, have been called redeemed and we have the opportunity to do all that we can to bless our Father back. David says, with all that is within me, with all of my soul, with the very depth of who I am, may God in heaven know that I love Him. May God in heaven know that I worship Him. May God in heaven know that I'm devoted to Him. Which, He knows if you are or not, by the way. So, you know, we can lift our hands in worship and we can cry as we sing songs of praise and as we read God's word and you can come down to the front later and say, I'm devoted. He's my all in all and I'm going to give him all that I have. But God knows if that's true. God knows if you're paying him lip service. We can't hide that from the Lord. In Mark 12, 30, Mark quotes Jesus as saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Can I tell you something I've told the students? I don't know if I've said it in here before, but I like it, so I'll say it. God will not share you. Now, sometimes... He waits a really long time to give you up. And when I say give you up, I don't mean if you're truly saved in him that you're snatched out of his hand. Jesus tells us as the good shepherd that we cannot be pulled from his hand. But God, in all of his holiness, probably one of the factors that we like to talk about but we don't actually discuss about God, he's holy, he is so much higher, he's so much different, He's so much set apart. The holiness of God will not share your desires. And if God is having to share you, or if God is having to give you up to your desires because you are not all in, He's going to know. I would hate for this church to have to be turned upside down in some egregious, sinful uproar because we are a church that does not love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. David said, all that I am. And you might say, well, I'm not David. I didn't just reach out and grab a bear and a lion and kill it. I didn't kill a man that was nine and a half feet tall. I didn't rule a nation. I didn't defeat enemy after enemy. 
I wasn't alive in the Bible in the Old Testament where it sees it seems like God just does miracles and he doesn't do them anymore. That's not me. Good. Because you weren't meant to be David. You were meant to be the exact person that God has ordered your steps for you to be. The Bible tells us that God orders our steps. Every path that we go on, if we're following him, he's got one for us. Sometimes he'll let us go off. Sometimes he'll let us stray. Sometimes if he knows he's about to share us, he'll go ahead and let us go off the path. Not as one of your staff up here teaching you tonight, but as a brother in Christ. Imagine that you and I are sitting across one another in a diner. Why diner? I don't know. That sounds like a great place to have a conversation. I don't drink coffee, but if you do, imagine coffee in your hand. As a brother in Christ, I'm begging you. Love him with all that you have. Love him with all that you have. God has a plan for things to get worse before they get better. We're going to see exactly the way things head right before Jesus comes back. And I'm not saying I want to prevent Jesus coming back and I want everything to be turned upside down all of a sudden. That I want the plan for the way things are going to come to a head to end. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when they do come to a head, we're going to need soldiers that are ready for battle. We're going to need servants. We're going to need people that love and they know that they love and they know that they love and there's nothing on the planet that can stop them from loving the Lord their God with all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their mind, and all of their strength. Stop going home over dinner and complaining to your family about the direction of the world and doing nothing to change it. If I have had it up to, not very tall, but if I've had it up to here with those kinds of believers and those kinds of churches, God's been dealing with it for years. And the Bible does tell us that He's slow to anger like we're going to see. We know that He's patient. We know that He's forgiving. But it's about time that the church of Jesus Christ stops taking advantage of that and starts taking Him seriously. David says, I'm going to bless the Lord with all that I have. Your name doesn't have to be David, but you can be that kind of person. God, I know what you've done for me. So this is what I'm going to do for you. Have we not seen God enough in our lives for this? Have we not? If we look back over our lives as believers with any sense of wherewithal about us, there's a, hey, wherewithal, there's another one. If we have any kind of sense of what's going on around us at all, if we have any kind of awareness in our lives of believers, we can look back and say there are benefits in the Lord. There are, there's the forgiveness of iniquity in the Lord. There's the healing of diseases in the Lord. There's redemption in the Lord. There's a, a crowning with love and mercy with a crown that, that comes just from the Lord. There's a satisfaction that comes with being in the Lord. And there's a renewal that comes from being in the Lord. And can I tell you, I don't know what it is that you're going through today, but there's one person that gives that holy as it comes. There's one person that gives that perfectly as it intended to be done. And it's the same person that lives inside of you every moment of your life if you are saved in Him. The Holy Spirit intends to live inside of your heart, not only to direct you, not only to guide you, but to remind you that there's a God that has moved mountains before. And even if He never moves another one for me ever again, with all that I am, with all within me, as David said, oh my soul, bless the Lord. God, I want to love you. God, I want to serve you. And can I tell you, I stand up here before you uh, as somebody that also fails to do this sometimes. I stand up here before you today as somebody that hasn't always, with all that is within me, blessed the Lord. That has made God share my soul. But He won't do it. And he won't do it for long. Are we the church that God has to share? Or are we the church that has room for nobody else? Are we the room, are we the church that in our hearts, for nothing, 
There's no desire. There's nothing and no one that we have room for but Jesus. Is that us? 6 through 14. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So can I tell you this? Uh, verses 8 through 10 tell us that Jesus or that the Lord is slow to anger. Uh, just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not true. And just because the enemy has blinded you and has calloused you with God not coming through exactly when you wanted him to does not mean that God is not still slow to anger. Something happens and you're like, man, is this God disciplining me right away? Is this God punishing me right away? The Bible says multiple times he's slow to anger. But how can that be true because I'm mad, I'm upset, my heart is broken over something? It says God is merciful. Is God still merciful even when we don't feel like he is? You better believe it. I said this the last time I taught for midweek. There's this, the speaker and the songwriter who had his voice almost taken away from sickness, cancer, I think it was. Um, and he looked back at the story of Job. And he said, wouldn't it have been merciful for God to not just put a, a man that loved him through all that? And he said, God could have left Job alone. Mercy is that he didn't. Mercy is that he had tragedy and he knows him better. That's what this speaker, this singer said. He said, the same is true for myself. God could have left me alone. Praise God that he didn't. I shared this with you. Three weeks from tonight is our due date for our baby girl. Do you know last year, God could have left us alone. Praise God that he didn't. Because I know him now like I've never known him before. I know him for the rest of my life. Like in the first 26 years of my life, I didn't know him. Whether we feel that way, he is. You might be going through the worst thing you've ever encountered right now, and you might think, God is supposed to have mercy. If you trust him, you will see his mercy in the growth that you are about to have after this. That's not the prosperity gospel. That's me saying God keeps his promises. And if we follow in the footsteps that he's ordered for us, we're going to see him in, in amazing ways. We're going to see blessings that the enemy is going to tell us to get off the path because he doesn't want us to see. Satan is smarter than you and me. In case anybody started thinking about a test they aced in high school that was really hard, you know, you've been nostalgic the last few days. Satan is much smarter than us. And all he wants us to do is just doubt that God is who he says he is. That the Bible is true. That we can trust that God is merciful. I don't know what the next three weeks are about to look like. But can I tell you? God is merciful. James 1.19 instructs believers to be slow to anger. Proverbs 16.32 says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. The best way, the best way, hear me, the best way 
that we can give glory to God for His mercy is to give mercy. You want to show God you take His mercy seriously? Give it to somebody else. And can I give you some homework? Of everybody you know, this next week, I want you to go to the person that's hardest to give it to and start there. Don't snowball your way into it. Show God you're serious. The best way to give Him the glory for His mercy is to give more mercy. That means that we understand this. We don't give people what they deserve. Why? Because we didn't get what we deserved. They've got it coming to them. Well, can I tell you, before 2,000 years ago, I had a lot more coming to me. But he showed me mercy. He sent his son, who was always appointed by the Spirit of Resurrection, according to Romans chapter 1, to be the Savior. And if it means taking him seriously, and if it means I understand, they may not get exactly what I want to say to them, but I'm alive, so I'm not going to say it. Sometimes it's not that hard. Sometimes we just have to put the devil in his place. Do you trust Jesus enough to find your satisfaction in Him enough to put the devil in His place in your life? God did not deal with us according to our sins, according to this scripture, or He did not repay us according to our iniquities because He always had a a plan to deal with Himself according to our sins and to repay Himself according to our iniquities. So if His word desires mercy then we give it God you're good and you're merciful so I'm going to try to live a life that is good and merciful because that's the best way that I can think to give you glory (coughs) 12 through 14 goes on to tell us that we have been completely separated from sin and its eternal consequences. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love. Do you remember that old hymn? Think about His love. Think about His goodness. Think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, So great are the measures of our Father's love. Great are the measures of our Father's love. So awesome is the love of Jesus that with one moment of a changed heart, eternally and with no distance that can ever be reached, our sin is completely separated from us. It and its consequences. Now, it's eternal consequences. That doesn't mean that we don't have day-to-day repercussions that we're going to deal with and deal with this whole thing where we think God's not merciful again. But I'm in Him forever. And He's in me forever. I abide in Him. He abides in me. He is my shepherd. I know His voice. And can I tell you one thing that, that, that Jesus doesn't say there when He's talking about being the good shepherd? and saying, but that his sheep still know his voice. Do you know if we have a close enough relationship with our shepherd to know his voice? Can I assure you that he knows yours? Can I assure you tonight that maybe you need to be praying for this mercy? That maybe you need to be praying for this healing in your life? That maybe you need to be praying for forgiveness that... Some, there's something you, that your situation needs to be redeemed, that you need to remind yourself that you have satisfaction, that He needs to renew you. And you think that you're just shouting it and it's hitting the ceiling and it's going away. But if I know my shepherd when He calls me, that has to mean 
that my shepherd knows me when I call on him. How beautiful that the ultimate great shepherd of everything, how humbling that he knows my voice when I call his name. We used to go to church with, with um, a couple of families. Two of the daughters were twins, grew up and got married. And they looked differently enough that I could tell the difference. Some people couldn't. But I remember one of the husbands telling me that when they were dating, that the other sister would answer the phone. Their voices kind of sound alike, too. The other sister would answer the phone. And he said he could tell most of the time. Now, I don't think they ever tried to do the strange things like go on a date and see if he can tell who it is. But he could tell the difference most of the time. There are approximately 8 billion people on this planet. Some voices sound the same, the same. But to a degree, they're all unique. There is not one voice that when the name of Jesus is not cried out, that God doesn't know exactly who it is, that God doesn't know exactly where it is, that God doesn't know exactly where it's been, and that God doesn't know exactly what the call on his name is for. Don't give up hope, church. It's amazing that he knows exactly what we are. He knows exactly who we are. Verse 14 says he knows our frame, that we're dust. He still did the work for us on Calvary. He still did the work for us at the empty tomb. And he still is working for us today. Why? Because he said he was going to. And when my shepherd says he's going to do something for me, it may not be in my time frame, but he's going to do it. If my shepherd says I'm going to have peace again, I'm going to have joy again, I'm going to have hope again, that there's going to be redemption in some way at some point, then I believe I'm going to get it. And there's not one lie that the enemy can tell me, there's not one person I can listen to, and there's not one book that I can read that will convince me that my father will not do exactly what he tells his children he's going to do for them. Don't lose hope. He says we're dust. Isaiah 64, 6 calls our righteousness, depending on the the a translation you have, a blood-stained rag, a polluted garment, a filthy cloth. Now, I'm sure you've heard this before, but specifically the referenced cloth here, when it says a blood-stained rag, would have been like rags or cloths that would have been used to clean up a woman during her time of the month that she would have used in that manner. I can't think of anything probably more disgusting and more lowly, especially in comparison to a holy God, than that kind of blood-stained rag. Yet, He forgives me, and He heals me, and He renews me, and I can be satisfied in Him, and He crowns me. Why? That's the kind of father that He is. 15 through 19, and we're almost done. As for man, so 14 says that he remembers our frame, he knows we're dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord... The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Isaiah 64, 6 also tells us that we all fade like a leaf. There are only few more things that are more fragile than the human life in all of eternity. We fade like a leaf. But how great is it that no matter how small we are in stature, no matter the little difference we feel like we make on this earth in this lifetime, no matter how short our life is, 
that there is an eternally big God, no matter how little we are, who sees us, who knows us, and who keeps us from everlasting to everlasting. For all of history, God has always kept His promises. And for all of history, God has always restored those who love Him and those who fear Him. Always. And can I tell you, you might have gone through something before and you're saying God wasn't in it. Or you might be in something right now and you're saying God's not in it. But can I remind you what I said earlier, that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if He's healed you one time, that must mean God is the healer. The enemy is going to try to convince us that if we're not healed, then that means God's not the healer anymore. That if, if there's a certain situation that's not restored the way that we want it to be, then God is not the restorer anymore. That if there's a situation where we're not renewed in the manner we want to be renewed, then God is not in the renewal business anymore. And you are at a crossroads in your life from the youngest person in here to the oldest person in here. Every day is a crossroads that you believe that the Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and you bank on it, or you believe the lies of the enemy. And you can say, Jacob, that's easier said than done. Yeah, sometimes it is. But what you can't do, what you've never been able to do, is all of it on your own. And what you have is somebody who's willing to fight for you. God said, I'll fight for you. You just need to be still. You just need to trust. You just need to know that there's peace. You just need to know there's hope. And there's not... I cannot put into enough words to beg you to believe that. I cannot put into enough words the truth and the right persuasion to beg you to want that for your life. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But what I can do is plead. What I can do is entreat you. There's a Pauline word. What I can do is say, please, keep fighting. Keep trusting because there's a dark there's a god that's done all this stuff in your past and if he's only healed you one time if you only feel renewed one time if you only feel restored one time that must mean that god is for all of eternity that kind of god do not be so swallowed up in the darkness that you forget that john chapter one says that that darkness cannot overcome the light No matter how deep you feel, no matter how deep your well, no matter how far off the road, no matter how sick your child or your grandchild is, no matter how much your marriage is failing, no matter how much it seems hard at school or at work or in your family, there is a God that can reach to the deepest places and find you. There is a God that can reach to the deepest places and pull you And let me remind you, if you were once dead and you are now alive, there is no place deeper than that. So if God can pull me out of the well of death, then I believe that He can bring me back on the right road again. Then I believe He can heal me with what I'm going through right now. He is eternally and He is forever Lord. He will always be the one in charge. He will always be the one on his throne. He will always be the one who calls the shots. He will always be creator. He will always be sustainer. He will always be deliverer. And there is nobody that I want on my side like him. There's nobody I want to know. And there's nobody I want to trust. There's nobody that I want to make me whole like him. And if it means that I have to wait a really long time to know what it means to be made whole in Jesus, then I'm going to pass up all the temporary stuff, all the stuff that can just kind of make me whole right now. Because I know that there's a completion, and I know that there's a restoration, and I know that Philippians 1.6 says that he who began a good work in you will complete it in the day of Christ Jesus, which must mean I may not see everything that God's ever promised me today. 
but I'm going to see it. And it is going to culminate in His immediate, eternal presence. So with all that I am, bless you, Lord. With all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength, bless you, Lord. Because you've blessed me infinitely more than I could even begin to think of how I can bless you. The last three verses say, Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of the Lord. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all his places, of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The Bible tells us that creation declares who God is. You can look outside at the sunset and it is preaching. Oh, there's a creator and he's good. Psalm says here, Psalm 103, verse 22, Bless the Lord all his works. If it wasn't possible for creation to sing the praises of God, I don't believe it would be in this verse right here. The Bible says even the rocks will cry out. So if I'm not going to be faithful as a member of his church, even inanimate creation will speak to how good he is. And if God, that's really how good you are, then sign me up. If that's really the kind of God that you are, then sign me up. But do you know what else a work of God is? You. David said, work of God, bless the Lord. Work of God, bless the Lord. We are a work of God. We are a creation of God. Our very existence, get this, and I'm I'm closing right now, our very existence is miraculous. The fact that you are alive is a miracle. Not by God's standards, but it should be by yours. Ephesians 2 calls us God's handiwork and tells us that we have a purpose and good works designed for our lives, that we were created that we may walk in those good works. Ephesians chapter 2. We exist right in the middle of our king's dominion. This tells us that he has dominion over all, that he's on his throne, that he reigns over everything, everywhere, in all of existence. That includes you and me. With our words, with our deeds, with our everyday practices, with our social interactions, with our offerings, with our worship, we must resolve that first we will bless the Lord. God, with my finances, I want to bless you. All right, I get it. Caitlin's going to wish she thought of that a long time ago. With how I love people, I want to bless you. With how I listen to you, I want to bless you. With how I give in to you, I want to bless you. With all that I have, all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength, God, I want to bless you. And can I tell you, if that's the mission of your family, and if that's the mission of this church, things might knock us down sometimes, but there is nothing that will keep us down. Because he's good. Father, we love you. God, we know that you're good. Even when we don't feel like it, you're merciful. Even when it's hard to trust you, you're still gracious to us. God, you have done an infinite amount of things. Even after just three years on this earth, or 33 years on this earth, three years in ministry, God, John said at the end of his gospel that there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain all the works of Jesus. And if if that's true about three years of earthly ministry, then God, all of existence could never contain the glory that you deserve the honor you deserve the worship that is yours God Psalm 103 is a perfect example of everything that you've done for us of your character 
So what we're asking now is that you would invade us, invade our character, so that it's like yours. We pray for those that weren't able to be with us tonight, God, that your Holy Spirit would bring them back to us, that this church would be marked by people that can't wait to get together in your name and can't wait to go out into this world in your name. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you today and forever. We pray in and under the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.